Good afternoon. I would like to ask Congressman Lutke Meyer from Missouri to join us and speak for us. Thank you. Congressman, welcome. Thank you. And, and thank you, sir. Good to be with you. Thank you. Well, I really don't have a whole lot to say because, uh, you know, the definition of optimist is giving a politician two minutes to speak. <laughs> so if you give me more than that, you're, you're really being generous here. So, but uh, uh, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Um, I would rather answer questions as to sit here. You know the issues as well or better than I do. And I'm sure you'd probably rather listen to an opinion or get some ideas or answers to some of your questions. Uh, you know, I'm supportive of what uh, you, you're trying to do, supportive of you as a, as a group. Uh, I think uh, Iran as a country is a, has a lot of promise. Unfortunately, you have some people running it right now that are, you know, not the best people in the world to do that. I mean, they're, 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 they're more bad guys than good guys, quite frankly. So uh, you know that better than I do. Uh, but uh, that's just the way it is right now. So uh, whatever we can do to be helpful, I'm going to be continue to do that. Uh, we had a great conversation a while ago and uh, a lot of good information back and forth. So um, I'd, I'd really just take your questions. Yes, ma'am. So first of all, Congressman, I want to thank you for supporting the resolution. As you yeah. know, this is a very important resolution. It really brings a bipartisan voice into the issue of Iran, the issue of human rights and terrorism. <clears throat> what advice do you have for the community to get more support from their members of Congress on this important issue? Because I think it really helps the White House <clears throat> Sure. Well, I was in a, in a, at a dinner last night, and the president was there, and he was talking about uh, the things that are going on there in Syria and, and uh, Turkey and the Kurds and Iran and Russia and China and all the folks there that are the players in that area there right, with regards to what came, came about here the last couple of weeks. And, you know, he's, he's very concerned about uh, the future of the area, and he's trying to find a way to sort of destabilize it or to stabilize it so that it doesn't blow up. But I think from the standpoint of um, what I think you can do, and I tell this to everybody when they come to my office, I think you need to just be able to tell a story. Each one of you has a story. Each one of you has a great story, a personal story that you could tell this morning, a great story about why you came to this country, what you believe is going on there is right or wrong, and how you can be helpful or not helpful. And your personal story is very impactful to somebody like me. Because we are used to talking to lobbyists who talk at 30,000 feet and talk about all the issues like that. But whenever you can bring it home to an individual, that is impactful. That means something. So when you, when you talk to myself and my colleagues, tell your personal story or stories of your family members or friends or acquaintances, whoever it is, that uh, can be impactful to make your case. Uh, that's, how you can, that's how you can make the best sale, quite frankly. Um, and you are the best salesman for that because you can tell the story better than anybody else. So don't be shy. You know, we don't bite normally. Uh, so, uh, and we want to listen to those stories because we want to know what's really going on. Every one of us, we can, we can listen to the TV and the media and, you know, that's, that's one side. Let's listen to your side. Listen to your side, what you, what's really going on, how you really feel, what the, what the behind the scenes stuff that you've had to endure or know about or can, fill in the blanks for us. That's what we really need. We need that kind of information. And so only you can give that to us. And that's why it's important that you're here. I thank you for that. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for being here, Congressman. Yeah. One of the issues Congress has really been a, uh, front and center has been the issue of human rights in Iran. Right. And, uh, in the last session of Congress, you yourself uh, co-sponsored House Resolution 188, uh, pointing the light in Iran civil rights violations and massacre in 1988 in Iran. Uh, but yet, um, just last month, we had a, a, a photo exhibition, a vigil on Capitol Hill, really on Capitol lawns, about the issue. And Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee said, those who are in charge of this massacre are still in charge today. What can we do? to try to get this more traction on an international level? And what can the United States perhaps, the administration of others, do to help us uh, hold those in charge of Iran, uh, the regime, accountable for this uh, abject uh, massacre? Well, I think, you know, you need to get 
You need to get the media on your side. I mean, these are stories that they normally like to cover, um, although they don't like this administration. And so if this administration supports it, they probably won't want to cover it. And so uh, that's unfortunate because this is a nonpartisan issue. This shouldn't be partisan at all. Uh, but it's, everything has become partisan around here over the last three years. Uh, not that before that it wasn't, it just raised it to another level as a result of, of uh, Mr. Trump's election. But I think, um, you know, those, those issues are important to, again, tell your story, uh, get in front of a camera, uh, have delegations to go to the White House, delegations to come see us, raise it with us, have advocates here in Congress to work on those issues, to keep their, 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 the spotlight on the issue. Um, the president deals from 30,000 feet, and sometimes, um, as you see in China right now, I mean, China is a, you know, what do you do with the human rights issues versus the economic issues versus the military issues? I mean, there's, there's three balls in the air here, and he's trying to keep them all in the air. And how do you how do you solve that problem? Um, sometimes one of those issues doesn't get as much priority, perhaps, as it needs to be, or you don't use it as leverage against the other two because it may not give you the kind of leverage that you want, the outcome that you want. So, um, I can't give you a, <laughs> a good, a much better answer than that other than, you know, you need to keep that issue in front of people. Uh, again, you are the best advocate for that issue. Um, you know, the president. I think you've seen him react to human rights, uh, and, and especially in Syria when the, you know they, they was aware of gassing people. He immediately came out and and uh, did some bombings of, of the of the Syrian government. Uh, so he, but it, it's unfortunate it takes an excessive situation like that to occur when there are ongoing civil rights problems every day. That just you know better than I do. Um, so again, I think it's telling your story, keeping it out there, keeping the media focused on it, uh, getting some advocates in Congress, and you know, having your, your group make sure they have an advocate to the White House somewhere, to the administration, to be able to push the State Department, Defense Department, whoever else needs to be aware of it. But, and you can do some of this through shank, sanctions. I mean, we can, you know, um, if, you, if you work with the Commerce Department, such that uh, you can say, look, you know, we need to bring these people to the table and civil rights need to be a part of this and you can use sanctions to bring those, those people to the table for that. I mean, there, there's other ways to get to where you want to get to sometimes. Yes? Yes? I think was uh, we talking about today, as I mentioned, the appeasement policy was a failure for the past four decades. And then, uh, as I mentioned, Iranian American majority support the president's because of his policy. Regarding Iran, the main thing is the, it's a policy matter. So his policy regarding changing appeasement policy to the foreign policy is great. But isn't it the time, as you mentioned, why Iranian people are not out? Isn't it time for the person like such as yourself support the resistance of Iran? That with the combination of the Iranian people and the resistance will topple the regime. What your thought is? No, I think that's that's probably true. Um, you know, this this president is a little different from past U.S. presidents from the standpoint that he's not necessarily for um, regime change. And then, have, you know, he, he wants the people to do that. He doesn't want to do that himself. He doesn't want the United States to be the point of the spear on a regime change. Uh, in this situation, he, you know, getting support for um, the Iranian uh, rebel fighters perhaps would be a way to go about that, that he would be willing to look at and support. Uh, the sanctions are a way that he can do this sort of indirectly. Uh, but this president doesn't like to nation build. He doesn't, as you see with in the, the Turkish, Turkish, Kurdish, Syria situation there and with other issues, he, he doesn't want to be in the middle of those fights that never end um, and believes that the people who are there should be in control of that. We can pick a side and help. But we shouldn't be the one making a decision on how this all goes. Um, and that, that, that's just his position and I think so we're going to have to work with that from that from that point of view, and uh, in that regard, I think, uh, yeah, getting his support, the State Department, Defense Department support for for the rebels would be a good way to go. And I, I personally don't sit on the committee, so I don't know where that's at. You probably know better than I do whether whether there's some behind the scenes support there. But we um, have a lot of congressmen and women supporting the resistance of Iran. Yeah. But as you mentioned. 
Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good. Well, thank you for coming. And you have been always supportive of our cause. So thank you very much. We, as you know, we are advocate for an Iran that is democratic, secular, and non-nuclear. Uh, I'm wondering how we can highlight more the terror activity of the Iranian regime and how we can clip these tentacles that are spread across the Middle East. That's a great question. I, I'm sure the administration would like to do the, know the answer to that one. Um, you know, I think it goes back to, um, a, again, getting the media to, to give, your, give you attention for your story, give the media, uh, point the spotlight on what the regime is doing now to oppress its people or uh, the, the nuclear development that they've got. Um, you know, uh, you know, the past administration had a nuclear deal where they're going to allow them to continue to build the uh, nuclear devices, and although extended out, I mean, everybody thought that was a good deal. I don't know how letting people keep, you know, guns to play with is a, is, is a, is a good idea whenever you're getting ready to shoot people. I mean, that, and you leave the bullets in their hand. I mean, this is basically what they did. So I don't really think that's a, a so I, I think, you know, the media has got to be willing to be on your side on this issue and, and give them a reason to be there, show why the people are being oppressed or they're being, uh, you know, uh, some other way of being, being hurt or injured or imprisoned or whatever, uh, so that there can be a, uh, you know, an empathy factor there so that people can see that, yes, this is a bad regime. Yes, these are bad people. These are people who don't need to be in charge. These are people who have nefarious um, goals down the road that we need to be able to thwart. We need to be help people who want to thwart those goals. Um, to me, that's, um, you know, I think the media plays a big part in that to, to gin up the support of the American people. And your stories, as I said a while ago, are what can help uh, my colleagues and I to be able to be supportive of you along that line as well as the president. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been told one more question. For one more question. I've got another meeting here shortly, so 1 30, so we need to get. Um, yes. First of all, I want to uh, thank you for your continuous support always to our cause and what we are uh, advocating for, um, being an age as actually uh, seven for the last one. Um, we uh, wholeheartedly support the maximum pressure policy, of course, our communities do, given the Iran's regime's track in the Middle East, around the globe, and IRGC being on the FTO list finally. I think it's about time, and I want to get your thoughts on it, on the MOIS, the Ministry of Intelligence of Iran, being placed on the FTO listing, simply because of these terrorist activities and the so-called diplomats conducting the surveillance and the bombings and the holding detonators, et cetera, around the globe. I think that would be in a step in the right direction further. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a State Department administration decision, but I think when people engage in those kind of activities on a continuous basis, they certainly uh, put themselves in a position to be, 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 be labeled like that. And I think, um, you know, when you have to call, you know, I come, I come from the rural part of, of this country. I come from Missouri, and the rural part of Missouri. I come probably from the smallest town of any congressman in the United States, 326 people, that's the size of my town. So. You know, where I come from, you talk in very plain terms. So if, if somebody's a bad guy, you call them a bad guy. And it's just that simple. And so if these people, uh, which we can see every day, are doing bad and nefarious things and have bad and nefarious goals, uh, it's pretty simple that they should, uh, we should find a way to curtail that activity and call it like it is. And I think um, not doing that is, is hiding the fact of who they really are, hiding their real true identity. And I think um, that does all of you a disservice, and it does the world a disservice, actually, because everybody needs to be called out on what they're really doing and pointed to. And, and uh, you know, that's one thing about this president. He's not afraid to tell you what he thinks and call a spade a spade. You know, he'll call it like it is, and some people don't like that. But at the end of the day, um, it is what it is. And if you can't call something white or black or yes, yes or no, I mean, you know, that's people need to know. And so I think it's important that that happens. So.